So, I, you know, giving 2020 a slogan, I don't know. It could be something like, you know, this is crazy, but wait till tomorrow. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson. In today's Ask an Expert segment, I'm going to be sitting down with Richard Davis. He's the founder of an agency called Spark. He's also the innovator behind a crowdsourcing platform called Slogan Slinger. It's helped thousands of businesses around the world. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of video and how you should be using it in your business. We're going to talk about perseverance, and we're also going to be talking about having an authentic voice and where you should actually get that voice. So let's get started. Okay, so Richard, thank you very much for, uh, for coming on our Ask an Expert segment. Uh, I appreciate you coming on board today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Awesome. So starting, coming out of the gates here, uh, you founded a company, uh, Slogan Slingers, um, and I'm interested to kind of know, this is kind of like a crowdsourcing, at least it feels like a crowdsourcing uh, service that you have. I'm interested to know where, uh, where this got started or what was the genesis behind this? Sure. So I have my main business, if you want to call it, that is a marketing firm. So we have a full service advertising agency. And uh, 10 years ago, um, well, my son was diagnosed on the autism spectrum at age three. And as we were sort of like getting out of the recession or still really in a tough economic time um, and had my wife's student loans to pay for and just a lot of other things, my son's, you know, healthcare expenses that were just astronomical. I needed some other way other than my main business to make money. And um, I needed to do, I was working like crazy on the agency. So I needed something that was automated. And at the same time, I noticed like writers are like really like we're creative people. That's my background is in writing. Okay. And but we're also can be really competitive. So kind of like needing a business idea that could produce money to basically keep my keep us uh, above water. Number one. And also I had this just this um, way that, you know, writers could kind of compete with each other. That would be like kind of our sport. That was sure. sort of the idea of slogan slingers. And so the way the site works is, you know, rather than go to an agency like I have, you know, during the day, and there's still some value to that, but let's say you're a small pizza shop or something yeah. and you don't have a lot of money, um, rather than coming in and to an agency and getting maybe four or five options that can be pretty expensive and it takes a couple of weeks to get, what if you opened it up to everybody and you put up whatever cash prize that you want to put up, and then you have writers from all over the world competing to come up with the best slogan and you only pay the winner. So you get a lot of entries. Um, it's pretty uh, inexpensive and it's pretty quick. We have close to a hundred thousand writers right now on the site. Wow. And um, yeah, it's a really great way to, um, to get a slogan if you need one. So I'm curious, you know, I, I get the concept, right? It's uh, you know, crowdsourcing is obviously a, a great way to go. And from your standpoint, from uh, just operational, set it, forget it, let it kind of run on its own. But how did you actually create the the website and the tool to connect an audience, you know, these small business audience with the actual resources of these writers, uh, presumably all across the world? Right. So they're everywhere. We've had contests and you know, countries in every continent, I think, except Antarctica. So, um, so the way I built it, we actually have web developers here at the agency. So okay. part of that work was done here. Part of the design work and the UI UX stuff was done here. And, um, and then some we outsourced to uh, an Indian firm just to help with some of the other programming because, you know, our guys have full-time jobs and we just, you know, I did it in my spare time basically from, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. every night for okay. months and months and months. And it slowly took shape and it, you know, it still continues to take shape. We're, we're continually like trying to implement new things and make it better. And I can't spend too much time on it, but, um, but we're always trying to kind of like make it a better experience for people. Okay. Uh, well, we are in a, um, a very peculiar time right now. Uh, right. So I, I'm curious if you were to put a slogan around where we are at this confluence of, of events, uh, what, what kind of slogan might we put around 2020? So, I, you know, giving 2020 a slogan, I don't know. It could be something like, you know, this is crazy, but wait till tomorrow. I don't know. Like, I don't know what we would, what we would say. Um, it's, it's definitely been an, an interesting, an interesting time. And we actually have had a lot of contests on slogan slingers dealing with coronavirus. So we've okay. had healthcare instant, um, healthcare organizations trying to do safety slogans. Sure. We've had several companies that are like mass companies or, um, you know, personal protection equipment companies needing slogans. 
So we've certainly had a lot of those on, on the slogan itself for 2020. I didn't even know. Well, I, I, I think whatever slogan, whatever slogan you come up with might be, uh, it might be stale by the time tomorrow hits. So that's right. We need to be prepared for whatever crisis is in, you know, coming later this summer. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious from a, from a business standpoint, how do you think businesses should be adapting um, or evolving their messaging um, right now? Because it is, you know, we really are, are kind of hit with a, a perfect storm, right? We have the, uh, the coronavirus hits. So there's a health issue. The economic falls right behind that. Um, and, you know, just in the past week, week and a half, we have the uh, major social, you know, rising. Um, what do you think businesses should be doing to adapt their messaging and to, I guess, be cognitive of, of where we're at? Right. So one of the things that you got to immediately avoid is is starting to sound cliche because everyone, you and I are talking about it, people all over the country, all over the world are talking about this, and you start to get a lot of messages that sound very similar. So okay. I think there was a, a commercial break I was watching when I was watching the news where there were three cur- commercials in a row that started with like, in these uncertain times, you know, or in these challenging times. And so you can get lost with whatever you have, but if you start at exactly the same, um, you know, you, you need to still do something that's, that you're, you are cognizant of the times, but in a way that, that helps you stand out a little bit. I would say the bigger thing, even than, um, you know, what you say is so many people have decided to not say anything at all. And they've either because they don't know what the future holds have decided to stop marketing or they've cut it way back. And what I've noticed, well, I mean, there's a great case study of in the um, in the depression, there was post cereal and there was Kellogg's. I don't know. Have you heard this? Uh, no. no. Okay. So what happened in the depression was post cereal and Kellogg's were kind of neck and neck at the time. Post decided to cut their advertising and Kellogg's decided to keep going, just like fighting it through, even though sales were down and times were bad. Sure. And Kellogg's began rising and post, they say 90 years later or whatever, has never caught back up. Okay. Now you could also say like, you know, well, Kellogg's had Tony the Tiger and Corn Flakes and Post had Grape Nuts, which is a very fun and not well named and no mascot, whatever. But, um, you know, when we were having the recession, I, I remember bringing that story up with clients like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I've never been through a downturn like this, but, you know, this is what happened with companies back then. And sure enough, like our clients back then who um cut cut back like they really got clobbered and the ones who kept going came out of it like way ahead and i'm seeing already the same thing even though it was sort of like a really small dip and we're we're kind of starting to see already um emerging uh i think the the most important thing is and we might have economic problems for a while the thing is just whatever you do just keep keep going and make sure you're heard because if you're quiet you're going to fall out and other people are going to take that space yeah, we just did a webinar on um, rebounding, basically rebounding uh-huh. your business past this. And um, some of the research that we did was specifically around, you know, what should you be doing during and post? Um, and a Harvard business study actually said exactly what you said, which is you need to be still maintaining, you know, it's gut reaction. I think you need to pull back, but it's actually going to be to the detriment of your long term success, right? So it's a short term play. I'm shocked that Harvard and I said the same thing on anything. That's uh, I can't wait to tell my wife that. <laughs> there you go, honorary right. uh, honorary diploma. Um, yeah, absolutely. So definitely, uh, we're in congruency. You know, as far as maintaining, um, you know, keeping the marketing going. Um, obviously, being smarter about it um, from a channel perspective. Um, do you think businesses should be looking to adapt the channels that they are marketing in? Uh, absolutely. But I think the bigger, um, you know, more important thing to take is that businesses should always be doing that. And I think in times like this, yeah, I almost said it in an uncertain time like this, um, <laughs> you need to be looking at your channels, but really that's something because now it's, uh, it's painfully obvious that the world is changing, but right. the world is changing all the time, maybe just in not as obvious ways. So I think you always need to be looking at, you know, am I saying the right things? Am I saying the right things to the right audience? Am I saying the right things to the right audience on the right platforms? What's my competition doing? Who's my future competition? These are all exercises that we should be doing all the time. So yeah, absolutely. Like look at everything now, but make sure that once things settle into whatever the new normal is, um, that you're going to continue to look because you it might not be as 
obvious as a shift as is taking place now, but things are always changing. So staying in this lane, um, sure. the one channel that you and I are talking on right now is video. Um, yes. And I think, you know, if you went back three months ago and we talked about video from, from your and I standpoint as an agency, you know, talking to clients, you're thinking, you know, high value production, you know, we've got lighting and rigging and, you know, expensive cameras. Um, what's happened in the past three months is very interesting um, from from everybody being forced to suddenly be, you know, physically distanced and starting to use video. Um, the one thing that has been interesting to me or in my observation is that people who were hesitant to get on video before because they weren't comfortable. I don't like the way I sound. I don't like the way I look. Suddenly it's normalized. And this has created this opportunity for people to communicate in a way that they haven't by leveraging video. What do you think the future is for businesses to use video kind of looking forward now that we've broken down this facade that videos, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. We're, we're still recommending, you know, high production video for our clients. We're doing a couple of shoots right now. So there's still value for that, but there's an opportunity to, to maybe use video in a different way that we weren't doing before. Absolutely. It's been really interesting as you watch like major network programming, like um, the late night talk shows, or some of the, um, you know, my um, son was watching John Oliver the other day. And um, like, that's basically filmed at his house with a green screen, like minimal lighting. And if the content is good or interesting to your audience, like people will respond. Now, we do a lot of work with restaurants and food companies. And, you know, I can't like have this cheeseburger and show it on, a, uh, you know, through a Zoom, and it's going to like get people's appetites uh, going. But um, certainly, um, video is performing and we're seeing the analytics of it. It's not just anecdotal. And, and we were seeing it even before any of this stuff, like social media posts using video perform at such a, a, um, a higher level than, you know, just a still photo and static sure. and, and just type. Um, but even more so now. So yeah, I think, and, and, and costs are coming down and for a lot of things, yeah, you don't have to have as high production values. So I think it's opening it up for a lot of people. The barrier to entry is a lot less. So, you know, and you think about too, how our world is changing where we would have put a client maybe six months ago on let's say radio and billboards. Well, when people aren't driving as much, they're not listening to the radio. Right. Um, they're not passing the billboard. So video is, you're pretty much guaranteed. And heck, even when people are driving now, I've seen people looking at video <laughs> and um, that's not good, but they're doing it. Sure. Um, so yeah, so I think video has never been bigger and I think it's only going to grow from here. Okay. So my next question then is around um, what I've, I'm finding is, is the most important factor when it comes to video. Um, and really it's, it's actually any content, like you talked about good content. Um, but I feel like the basis for good content is authenticity. Um, so how does a business really think, how does a business kind of evaluate what, what makes them authentic um, and, and what that voice is and how do they maintain that when sometimes, especially once the lights come on, we feel like maybe we have to perform instead of just being ourselves. Okay. So I'm going to tell you something that Harvard probably will now not agree with me on okay. and you might not agree with me on. It's probably going to shock people a little bit, but I think it's super important to have a voice and to have a unique voice and make sure that that voice is heard. Now, having that true, authentic voice, you know, I think in some ways is overrated and to a degree, maybe even disingenuous in terms of that even being an actual thing that you can, you can really like do in a meaningful way. So I think about like great brands, like um, there's Geico and Disney and Target. And, you know, even what Old Spice did to elevate their brand was incredible. Yeah. Now, was that Old Spice's authentic brand? I mean, it came out of nowhere, it completely changed, and all of a sudden, it was a hit. I think about, like, Dos Equis and the most interesting man in the world. Was that Dos Equis' true, authentic voice? Or was that someone like me or someone like you that, that had, like, a great Creative. idea? That Right. So you manufacture it, and now – it. I think about like when Microsoft tries to be like this cool edgy brand and it falls flat. So you don't have complete free reign. It's got to work within sort of limitations. But I do think that, um, that to a degree it, it you know, uh, like, so let's take Arby's and we have the meats, right? Yeah. It's a great campaign and their sales like skyrocketed. So they had, whether you call it their true voice or not, had been talking about beef and meat forever. You know, people were asleep, like it didn't do anything. 
And then they basically just changed the way that they said it. You know, maybe that was their voice. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a clever ad guy. Maybe it was just this really different approach that other people were doing, but it made sense and, and, it, and it connected. So what I would say is, yes, you, you need to have like a voice. It's somewhat true-ish, I guess. Right. But it's really important to think about like the customer's ear first and then your own voice. And if you have something that's going to, um, that they're going to respond to, you can sort of craft your message around that. You can't be something you're not, but is Old Spice or Axe, you know, Axe Body Spray, is it really anything more than chemicals that are different from another brand? You know, I don't know. Or if you're a life, in, if you're like State Farm or, or let's say Progressive with Flow, you know, that's just like a great idea that seems to work. Right. Well then, so follow up question to that would be, do you think um, it, we need to be going out and identifying, Hey, what do we think the customers are gonna like? Or do we think, is there a void in the marketplace? Is there a void in the, all the voices out there? Um, which, which one would you lean towards? Yeah. Well, you always want to start with a customer. Absolutely. First and sometimes only because you know, voids are kind of like, you know, it's hard to say what that is, but a customer is like a real thing that you can get feedback from and who will respond. So you need to figure out, you know, what problems you're solving for them, what's going to resonate with them, what's going to connect emotionally with them and start to craft your message and even your product. Like, you know, you could have the greatest thing in the world, but if no one wants it, um, it's not, it's not going to work. So um, I think always starting with fulfilling their need and so let's take, um, you know, Old Spice. So you had this um, young audience that was, they didn't want to have their dad's Old Spice, which was boring. And so right. they rejuvenated and came up with, so they listened to what people, you know, what would work and then responded accordingly. And that's, that was a home run for them. How do you recommend um, kind of the... Um mom and pop is maybe not the, the demographic I'm speaking to, but the small business, you know, the, the proprietor that's out there, um, how do you recommend that they actually um, quantify the voice? Like how do they go out and how do they actually get that feedback um, yeah. to know which direction to go? Okay. So this is what to me is so cool about marketing now. So I used to do, like I started my career, I would do Ford commercials. I did stuff for Capital One, like big brands. So you had all these resources. So for Ford, we would have focus groups and we would have piles and piles of market research to make whatever silly, you know, commercial we were going to sure. make. So your mom and pop place, you have none of that, but you have something way better now is you've got, you've got social media, which is like the greatest focus group testing ground that's ever existed. Right. So you can run an ad on Instagram, run three different ads, run five different ads, run to different audiences. Um, so many different things that you can do and you get feedback on that for not that much money. We did a campaign recently. I think we reached a thousand people for like a dollar or something. So like, wow. <laughs> you know, so a thousand people on Instagram, Facebook, um, for not that much money, like you can be testing stuff all night and day and see what people respond to. And within not very long, you'll get a really nice picture of what works, what doesn't. And um, you still need to have good people that, you know, the mom and pop is limited in that you might not have access to talent. They can pull that messaging off. Right. But you'll get some basic understanding of offers that work and audiences that will respond and all kinds of really good stuff. Okay. And that's, that's great feedback. Um, and I, I do agree with you. It, it's kind of unprecedented times um, from a business to be able to touch consumers, you know, that otherwise they would never have access to and they can get it instantaneously. Um, yeah. So... Well, speaking of small businesses, speaking about operations, businesses have a lot going on right now. They had a lot going on three months ago. Right. What What is the thing that they need to make sure that they they, they don't lose track of um, as they're kind of coming out of this this current? Um, I don't even know what family, to, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, um, I think one thing is, that's really important is to just stay continually engaged with your audience. It goes a little bit back to what I was say, saying before, but I think when people get into the day to day, I see this with clients all the time. So they're watching their own videos like four or five times a day. They see their own logo. They see their every single social media post they do. They're, they're just living their brand every day. But to, to the rest of the world out there, you know, it's a mom trying to, you know, get the groceries and, um, you know, and get to her job and do all the stuff like that, what your brand is, whether it's your, you know, your protein chewing gum or your dating app or whatever, 
it it um it's like just a blip on someone else's radar so you have to keep putting out messages keep putting out content good content and just never let up i think the biggest mistake that people do when they're in the day to day is just thinking that everyone else is in that day to day with them and they're not. And so you really got to be persistent. Right. It's kind of the, if you build it, they will come, but you, you, you have to put in that legwork first in order for um, it to, to reap rewards. Right. And it's gotta be good. It's gotta be good content and relevant content and interesting, but um, you know, make sure that's uh, like, as we said before too, like that's what's going to resonate with your audience. <laughs> So I have a question, and this is one that you know sure. I think that I dreaded uh, in, in my past career. Definitely, it's like content, right? Everybody knows that we need to do it, um, but nobody likes doing it. Um, well, so what was we, your past career? Let me interview you for a second. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I headed up marketing and sales for um, an e-commerce direct marketing company. So okay. I'm focused. It's kind of like a Vista print, um, but it's focused for the real estate space. Gotcha. So we knew we needed to come up with content, but right, it's like. Uh, you know, when it's like my week on the calendar, I'm dreading it already. Um, do you have any hacks to be able to be topical and, and come up with content relatively pain free? Wow. You know, this is the hardest thing because even our company as a marketing firm, we have a tough time, you know, finding people that can producing good content is really, really, really hard. Sure. Um, so the, the biggest thing, you know, and this is where maybe it does go back to your having, maybe, you know, the authentic voice. So I don't know if a voice has to be authentic or not. I guess that's what we covered. But whoever is doing your content needs to understand what that voice is, manufactured or otherwise, and really know the brand and have a passion for the brand. And so it's two things. So you have to have that, but you also have to be skilled as either a writer or a designer or both and be able to take that, that kernel of um you know whatever it is that 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 fact that that interesting thing that that persuasive um differential and be yeah. able to articulate that in a way that makes sense you know hacks boy i, I would say use video as much as possible in, in short bursts to tell the story sure. but i don't know i wish i could tell you there was a shortcut for that but i i i really don't think there is i think you just have to have you have to have people that care about the brand and treasure the brand and stick those people on it and just you know continually measure to make sure what you're saying is getting a good result um it's hard to do and that's why there are professionals like us who can make a living off it. <laughs> well i'm gonna give i'm gonna give a little hack for us um, okay great I'll, we I'll leverage linkedin it. linkedin talks about hey here are the here are the trending topics that are happening today um and so we use that as a method to engage now, obviously for the clients that we work with linkedin's probably not the platform that they want to um but maybe twitter right what, what's trending on twitter what are the top 10 things pick one or two and to your point do a short format video that talks about your guys's perspective staying in that voice because that's definitely an important component. Um, but I think that's a good hack and it, it certainly has greased the wheels for our own organization for us to say, all right, well, what are we going to talk about today? It's like, well, yeah. people are already talking about something. So let's jump into the conversation that's already being had. Yeah, that's a good idea. And you know, sometimes that might not even lead to the post, but I guess a lot of times it's just coming up with the inspiration that could lead to something else. Yes. And so from that perspective, yeah, that's a good idea. We're going to try it. I'm going to put a note to my team and just to hit LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter tomorrow. There you go. There you go. Okay. So last thing, um, I I'm curious, actually, I have, I have two more questions. Okay, One sure. is, um, if you could go back in time and you could give yourself advice from, you know, an, an earlier stage when you're, you're just kind of starting your career, is there anything you've gleaned over the years that you think would be advantageous for you to know back then? Yeah. So this is, um, I would say, cause I was just thinking about this right before our, our interview. Okay is so we have this uh, an amazing person who's our chief strategic officer and he's handling operations and strategy and it was years into the business before i even realized operations was a thing i mean you do your own technical thing like we make websites and we make videos for people and we build apps but the and you know we just like well we'll work away and we'll do it that's all you do but but really operations is such an important part and especially coming from a creative field um, like we do, where you don't really think about, you're just focusing on, on the creative product, whether you're developing right. content or whatever. And everything is a process and everything is involving operations. And so spend you know, a lot more time focusing on that than you probably think you need to. And um, I'd say if I could go back in time, that's what I would tell myself is like, get a really good operations person and really 
pay more attention to that than than I ended up doing. So right. I probably wasted a few years of cumulative time. I, I think our business is, you know, it's it's closing in on 15 years that um, that I could have um, I, I probably wasted, you know, just from not paying attention to operations. Well, and and that's tough because I think it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know. Um, right. But I certainly, I, further along in my career, I've recognized that, hey, spend time evaluating where you're not strong and then right. find find a resource that fills that hole. Um, because to your point, you know, it, it's a tremendous time saver once you get somebody or something or service to, to fill that void. So is most of your audience, are they entrepreneurs, I guess, or are they? Um... A, a lot of them, you know, SMBs. Um, so, right. you know, CMOs, um, entrepreneurs. Yeah. So a lot of times, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you've just grown a company from something small to something bigger, I think at the beginning, you're used to wearing so many hats and yeah. it's hard to let that stuff go. And I've noticed that about myself too. It's like, because you know, at the beginning, if you didn't do it, no one was going to do it. And yeah. It's tough to like say, okay, I'm going to give it to someone else and trust them to do it. It's a hard thing to do, but you you it just you have to you have to force yourself to do it. Well, our, let's. It gives you more time to do what you're passionate about, to do what you're better at, right? Right. Which ultimately, Absolutely. you know, whether it's customers or clients or whatever your your services that you're providing, it, it's just going to be a better solution for them. So yeah, and you're just going to be happier throughout yeah, your day. Well, <laughs> there's that. That's important. Right. That's um, like the most thing. Most important. <laughs> So um, is there anything we haven't covered that you think is important um, for businesses kind of just just looking forward or where we're at today? Yeah. So, there's, well, there's one other thought that I, I would say. Um, so my, my brother actually has this company called 12 Mavens, which is like the CEO roundtable group, which is a bunch of okay. CEOs who like help each other out. Right. So when the um, when the pandemic hit, he lost a few members and some other people yeah. who just said, oh, gosh, there's no path forward for my business. They just like shut shut it down for good not just like temporarily and so he made a video the other day for his members he's got members all over the country saying basically you know all the entrepreneurs all the kind of wannabe businesses are now like they're out of the picture and the people that are left are like the fighters and the players and the real people and so like now's the time on some level these are like uh you know say it a third time challenging times these are tough times um but on some level you can be proud you can celebrate to a degree um, that you're, that you've made it through, that you're still fighting. And there's a lot of pride you can take in that. And just know that like, there are less people now in the picture competing. And if you survive this, you can survive anything and just keep fighting, keep working hard, keep marketing and saying, you know, what makes you different and what makes you special. And I I really do believe that the best days for companies are ahead. I think we've been through a rough time. We've got some more rough patches to go, but I think Long term wise, you know, the outlook is is good, I think. Well, that's good feedback. I listened to a podcast earlier today. Um, it was an author who was being interviewed. Um, and he he was talking about his first book, right? And uh he he once it finally was published, he was interviewed and he said, you know, the difference between a published author and a non-published author is that the published author never quit. Right. Hmm. So the, the fighting that you're talking about. So um, and, and yeah, you're right. If you can make it through this, then you can you can make it through anything. So um, that that's a great, uh, great sentiment. So, All right. well, awesome. I'd like to thank you for coming on board. Um, hope to have you back again. Um, uh, wish you guys nothing the best for your agency um, as thank well you. as your family. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And Harvard, you and me, we're on the same page. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let them know. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.